A Light on the Road to Woodstock by Ellis Peters The King's Court was in no hurry to return to England that late autumn of 1120. Even though the fighting, somewhat desultory in these last stages, was long over, and the enforced peace sealed by a royal marriage. King Henry had brought to a successful conclusion his sixteen years of patient, cunning, relentless plotting, fighting, and manipulating, and could now sit back in high content, master not only of England, but of Normandy, too. What the conqueror had misguidedly dealt out in two separate parcels to his two elder brothers, his youngest son had now put together again and clamped into one. Not without a hand in removing from the light of day, some said both of his brothers, one of whom had been shoveled into a hasty grave under the tower at Winchester, while the other was now a prisoner in Devizes, and unlikely ever to be seen again by the outer world. The court could well afford to linger to enjoy victory, while Henry trimmed into neatness the last loose edges still to be made secure. But his fleet was already preparing at Bar Floor for the voyage back to England, and he would be home before the month ended. Meantime, many of his barons and knights who had fought his battles were withdrawing their contingents and making for home. Among them, one Roger Maldwit, who had a young and handsome wife waiting for him, certain legal business on his mind, and twenty-five men to ship back to England, most of them to be paid off on landing. There were one or two among the miscellaneous riffraff he had recruited here in Normandy on his lord's behalf, whom it might be worth keeping on in his own service, along with the few men of his household, at least until he was safely home. The vagabond clerk turned soldier, let him be unfrocked priest or what he might, was an excellent copyist and a sound Latin scholar, and could put legal documents in their best and most presentable form, in good time for the king's court at Woodstock. And the Welsh man-at-arms, blunt and insubordinate as he was, was also experienced and accomplished in arms, a man of his word, once given, and utterly reliable in whatever situation on land or sea, for in both elements he had long practice behind him. Roger was well aware that he was not greatly loved, and had little faith in either the valor or the loyalty of his own men. But this Welshman from Gwynedd, by the way of Antioch and Jerusalem, and only God knew where else, had imbibed the coat of arms and wore it as a second nature. With or without love, such service as he pledged, that he would provide. Roger put it to them both as his men were embarking at Bar Floor in the middle of a deceptively placid November, and upon a calm sea. I would have you two accompany me to my manor of Sutton Maldite by Northampton, when we disembark, and stay in my pay until a certain lawsuit I have against the Abbey of Shrewsbury is resolved. The king intends to come to Woodstock when he arrives in England, and will be there to preside over my case on the twenty-third day of this month. Will you remain in my service until that day? The Welshman said that he would, until that day or until the case was resolved. He said it indifferently, as one who has no business of any importance anywhere in the world to pull him in another direction. As well Northampton as anywhere else, as well Woodstock, and after Woodstock, why anywhere in particular. There was no identifiable light beckoning him anywhere, along any road. The world was wide, fair, and full of savor, but without signposts. Allard, the tattered Damalian clerk, hesitated, scratched his thick thatch of grizzled red hair, and finally also said yes, but as if some vague regret drew him in another direction. It meant pay for some days more. He could not afford to say no. I would have gone with him with better heart, he said later, when they were leaning on the rail together, watching the low blue line of the English shore rise out of a placid sea, 
if he had been taking a more westerly road. Why that? asked Cadfile, up Melier, up Daffid. Have you no kin in the west? I had once. I have not now. Dead? I am the one who died. Allard heaved lean shoulders in a helpless shrug and grinned. Fifty-seven brothers I had, and now I'm brotherless. I begin to miss my kin. Now I'm past forty. I never valued them when I was young. He slanted a rueful glance at his companion and shook his head. I was a monk of Evensham, an oblatus, given to God by my father when I was five years old. When I was fifteen I could no longer abide to live my life in one place, and I ran. Stability is one of the vows we take, to be content in one stay and go abroad only when ordered. That was not for me, not then. My sort they call vagus, frivolous minds that must wander. Well, I've wandered far enough. God knows, in my time, I begin to fear I can never stand still again. The Welshman drew his cloak about him against the chill of the wind. Are you hankering for a return? Even you seamen must drop anchor somewhere at last, said Allard. They'd have my hide if I went back, that I know. But there is this about penance. It pays all debts and leaves the record clear. They'd find a place for me once I'd paid. I don't know. The vacuus is still in me. I'm torn two ways. After twenty-five years, said Cadfile, a month or two more, for quiet thinking can do no more harm. Copy his papers for him, and take your case until his business is settled. They were much of an age, though the renegade monk looked the elder by ten years, and much knocked about by the world he had coveted from within the cloister, and never paid him well in goods or gear, for he went threadbare and thin, but in wisdom he might have got his fair wages. A little soldiering, a little clerking, some horse tending, any labor that came to hand, until he could turn his hand to almost anything a hale man can do. He had seen, he said, Italy as far south as Rome, served once for a time under the Count of Flanders, crossed the mountains into Spain, never abiding anywhere for long. His feet still served him, but his mind grew weary of the road. And you, eyeing his companion, whom he had known now for a year in this last campaign, or was something of a vagus yourself, by your account. All those years crusading and battling corsairs in the Midland Sea, and still you have not enough of it, but must cross the sea again to get buffeted about Normandy. Had you no better business of your own once you got back to England? But you must enlist again in this muddled melee of a war? No woman to take your mind off fighting? What of yourself? free of the cloister, free of the vows. Somehow, said Allard, himself puzzled, I never saw it so. A woman here and there, yes, when the heat was on me, and there was a woman by and willing, but marriage and wiving, it never seemed to me I had the right. The Welshman braced his feet on the gently swaying deck and watched the distant shore draw nearer. A broad-set, sturdy, muscular man in his healthy prime, brown-haired and brown-skinned from the eastern suns and outdoor living, well-provided in leather coat and good cloth, and well-armed with sword and dagger, a comely enough face, strongly featured with the bold bones of his race. There had been women in his time who had found him handsome. I had a girl, he said meditatively, years back, before ever I went crusading, but I left her when I took the cross left her for three years and stayed away seventeen. The truth is, in the east I forgot her, and in the west she, thanks be to God, had forgotten me. I did inquire when I got back. She had made a better bargain and married a decent, solid man who had nothing of the Vargos in him, a guildsman and counselor of the town of Shrewsbury, no less. So I shed the load from my conscience and went back to what I knew, soldiering, with no regrets, he said simply, it was all over and done years since. I doubt if I should have known her again, or she, me. There had been other women's faces in the years between, 
still vivid in his memory, while hers had faded into mist. And what will you do? asked Alhard. Now the king's got everything he wanted, married his son to Anjou and Maine, and made an end of fighting. Go back to the east? There's never any want of squabbles there to keep a man busy. No, said Cadfile, eyes fixed on the shore that began to show the solidity of land and the undulations of cliff and down, for that too was over and done years since, and not as well done as once he had hoped. This desultory campaigning in Normandy was little more than a postscriptum, an afterthought, a means of filling in the interim between what was past and what was to come, and as yet unrevealed. All he knew of it was that it must be something new and momentous, a door opening into another room. It seems we have both a few days' grace, you and I, to find out where we are going. We best make good use of the time. There was stir enough before night to keep them from wondering beyond the next moment, or troubling their minds about what was past or what was to come. Their ship put into the roads with a steady and favorable wind, and made course into Southampton before the light faded. And there was work for Alhard checking the gear as it was unloaded and for Cadfile disembarking the horses. A night's sleep in lodgings and stables in the town, and they would be on their way with the dawn. So the king's dew in Woodstock, said Allard, rustling sleepily in his straw in a warm loft over the horses, in time to sit in judgment on the twenty-third of the month. He makes his forest lodges the hub of his kingdom. There's more statescraft talked at Woodstock, so they say, than ever at Westminster, and he keeps his beasts there, lions and leopards, even camels. Did you ever see camels, Cadfile, there in the east? Saw them and rode them, common as horses there, hard-working and serviceable, but uncomfortable riding and foul-tempered. Thank God its horses will be mounting in the morning. And after a long silence on the edge of sleep, he asked curiously into the straw-scented darkness, If ever you do go back, what is it you want of Evenshaw? Do I know? responded Alhard drowsily, and followed that with a sudden sharpening sigh. Again, fully awake, the silence it might be, or the stillness, to have no more running to do, to have arrived and have no more need to run. The appetite changes. Now I think it would be a beautiful thing to be still. The manor, which was the head of Roger Maldit, and substantial honor lay somewhat southeast of Northampton, comfortably under the lee of the long ridge of wooded hill, and spreading its extensive fields over the rich lowland between. The house was of stone and ample over a deep undercroft, and with a low tower providing two small chambers at the eastern end, and the array of sturdy byres, barns, and stables that lined the containing walls were impressive. Someone had proved a good steward while the Lord was away about King Henry's business. The furnishings of the hall were no less eloquent of good management, and men and maids of the household went about their work with a brisk wariness that showed they went in some awe of whoever presided over their labors. It needed only a single day of watching the Lady Edwina in action to show who ruled the roost here. Roger Mulduit had married a wife not only handsome, but also efficient and masterful. She had had her own way here for three years, and by all the signs had enjoyed her dominance. She might even be none too glad to resign her charge now, however glad she might be to have her lord home again. She was a tall, graceful woman, ten years younger than Roger, with an abundance of fair hair and large blue eyes that went discreetly half-veiled by absurdly long lashes most of the time, but flashed a bright and steely challenge when she opened them fully, concealing rather than revealing whatever went on in her mind, and, and though her welcome to her returning lord left nothing to be desired, but lavished on him every possible tribute of ceremony and affection from the moment his horse entered at the gate. Catfile could not but wonder whether she was not at the same time. 
taking stock of every man he brought in with him, and every article of gear or harness or weaponry in their equipment, as one taking jealous inventory of his goods and reserves to make sure nothing was lacking. She had her little son by the hand, a boy of about seven years old, and the child had the same fair coloring, the same contained and almost supercilious smile, and was as spruce and fine as his mother. The lady received Alhart with a sweeping glance that deprecated his tattered appearance and doubted his morality but nevertheless was willing to accept and make use of his abilities. The clerk who kept the manor roll and the accounts was efficient enough but had no Latin and could not write a good court hand. Allard was whisked away to a small table set in the angle of the great hearth and kept hard at work copying certain charters and letters and preparing them for presentation. "'This suit of his is against the Abbey of Shrewsbury,' said Alhard, free of his labors after supper in the hall. I recall you said that girl of yours had married a merchant in that town. Shrewsbury is a Benedictine house, like mine of Evensham. His he called it still, after so many years of abandoning it, or his again, after time had brushed away whatever division there had ever been. You must know it if you come from here. I was born in Trefee, in Gwened, said Cadfile, but I took service early with an English wool merchant and came to Shrewsbury with his household. Fourteen I was then. In Wales, fourteen is manhood, and I was a good lad with a short bow and took kindly to the sword. I suppose I was worth my keep. The best of my following years were spent in Shrewsbury. I know it like my own palm, abbey and all. My master sent me there a year and more to get my letters but I quit that service when he died. I pledged nothing to the son, and he was a poor shadow of his father. That was when I took the cross. So did many like me, all the fire. I won't say what followed was all ash, but it burned very low at times. It's Malduit who holds this disputed lance in Alhard, and the abbey that sues to recover it, and the thing's been going on four years without a settlement ever since the old man here died. From what I know of the Benedictines, I'd rate their honesty above our Rogers, I tell you straight. And yet his charters seem to be genuine, as far as I can tell. Where is this land they're fighting over? asked Cadfile. It's a manor by the name of Rotisley, near Stretton, Domain, village, at Vowson of the church and all. It seems when the great earl was just dead and his abbey still building, Roger's father gave Rotesley to the abbey. No dispute about that. The charter's there to show it. But the abbey granted it back to him as tenant for life, to live out his latter years there undisturbed, Roger being then married and installed here at Sutton. That's where the dispute starts. The abbey claims it was clearly agreed the tenants it with the old man's death, that he himself understood it so, and intended it should be restored to the abbey as soon as he was out of it. While Roger says there was no such agreement to restore it unconditionally, but the tenancy was granted to the Madwits and ought to be hereditary, and so far he's hung on to it tooth and claw. After several hearings they remitted it to the king himself, and that's why you and I, my friend, will be off with his lordship to Woodstock the day after tomorrow. And how do you rate his chances of success? He seems none too sure of himself, said Cadfile, to judge by a short temper and nail-biting this last day or so. Why, the charter could have been worded better. It says simply that the village is granted back in tenancy during the old man's lifetime, but fails to say anything about what shall happen afterwards, whatever may have been intended. From what I hear, they were on very good terms, Abbot Fulchurid and the old lord, agreements between them on other matters in the manor book, are worded as between men who trusted each other. The witnesses are all of them dead, as Abbot Fulchurid is dead. It's one Godhafrid now, but for all I know the abbey may hold letters that have passed between the two, and a letter is witness of intent, no less than a formal charter. All in good time we shall see. The nobility still sat at the high table, 
in no haste to retire roger brooding over his wine of which he had already drunk his fair share and more catfile eyed them with interest seen thus in a family setting the boy had gone to his bed hauled away by an elderly nurse but the lady edwina sat in close attendance of her lord's left hand and kept his cup well filled smiling her faint demure smile on her left sat a very fine young squire of about twenty-five years deferential and discreet with the smile somehow the male reflection of her own the source of both was secret the source of their pleasure or amusement or whatever caused them so to smile remained private and slightly unnerving like the carved stone smiles of certain very old statues catfile had seen in greece long ago for all his mild amiable and ornamental appearance combed and curled and courtly he was a big well set up young fellow with a with a set to his smooth jaw catfile studied him with interest for he was plainly privileged here gosselin said alhart by way of explanation following his friend's glance a right-hand man while roger was away her left-hand man now by the look of it thought cadfile for her left hand and goslin's right were private under the table while she spoke winningly into her husband's ear and if those two hands were not paddling palms at this moment cadfile was very much deceived above and below the drapings of the board were two different worlds i wonder he said thoughtfully what she's breathing into roger's ear now what the lady was breathing into her husband's ear was in fact you fret over nothing my lord what does it matter how strong his proofs if he never reaches woodstock in time to present them you know the law if one party fails to appear judgment is given for the other the assize judges may allow more than one default if they please but do you think king henry will whoever fails of keeping tryst with him will be felled on the spot and you know the road by which prior heribert must come her voice was a silken purr in his ear and have you not a hunting lodge in the forest north of woodstock through which that road passes roger's hand had stiffened round the stem of his wine cup he was not so drunk but he was listening intently shrewsbury to woodstock will be a two or three day journey to such a rider all you need do is have a watcher on the road north of you to give warning the woods are thick enough masterless men have been known to hunt there even if he comes by daylight your part need never be known hide him but a few days it will be long enough then turn him loose by night and who's ever to know what footpads held and robbed him you need not even touch his parchments robbers would count them worthless take what common thieves would take and theirs will be the blame roger opened his tight shut mouth to say in a doubtful growl you'll not be travelling alone ah two or three abbey servants they'll run like hares you need not trouble yourself over them three stout silent men of your own will be more than enough he brooded and began to think so too and to review in his mind the men of his household seeking the right hands for such work not the welshmen and the clerk the strangers here their part was to be the honest onlookers in case there should ever be questions asked they left sutton malduit on the twentieth day of november which seemed unnecessarily early though as roger had decreed that they should settle in his hunting lodge in the forest close by woodstock which meant conveying stores with them to make the house habitable and provision it for a party for presumably a stay of three nights at least it was perhaps a wise precaution roger was taking no chances in his suit he said he meant to be established on the ground in good time and have all his proofs in order but so he has said allard pricked in his professional pride for i've gone over everything with him and the case if open and default of specific instructions is plain enough and will stand up what the abbey can muster who knows they say the abbot is not well which is why his prior comes in his place my work is done he had the faraway look in his eye as the party rode out and faced westward of one either 
penned and longing to be where he could but see, or loose and weary and being drawn home. Either a vagus escaping outward, or a penitent flying back in haste before the door should close against him. There must indeed be something desirable and lovely to cause a man to look toward it with that look on his face. Three men-at-arms and two grooms accompanied Roger, in addition to Alhard and Cadfile, whose term of service would end with the session in court, after which they might go where they would. Cadfile horsed, since he owned his own mount. Alhard, afoot, since the pony he rode, belonged to Roger. It came as something of a surprise to Cadfile that the squire Gosselin should also saddle up and ride with the party very debonair and well-armed with sword and dagger. "'I marvel,' said Cadfile dryly, "'that the lady doesn't need him at home for her own protection while her lord's absent. The lady Edwina, however, bade farewell to the whole party with the greatest serenity and to her husband with demonstrative affection, putting forward her little son to be embraced and kissed. Perhaps, thought Cadfile, relenting, "'I do her wrong.' simply because I feel chilled by that smile of hers. For all I know, she may be the truest wife living. They set out early, and before Buckingham made a halt at the small and penurious priory of Bradwell, where Roger elected to spend the night, keeping his three men-at-arms with him, while Gosselin with the rest of the party rode on to the hunting lodge to make all ready for their lord's reception the following day. It was growing dark by the time they arrived, and the bustle of kindly fire and torches and unloading the bed linen and stores from the sumpter ponies went on into the night. The lodge was small, stockaded, well furnished with stabling and mews, and in thick woodland, a place comfortable enough once they had a roaring fire on the hearth and food on the table. The road the prior of Shrewsbury will be coming by, said Allard, warming himself by the fire after supper, passes through Evensham. As like as not, they'll stay the night there. With every mile west, Cadfile had seen him straining forward with mounting eagerness. The road cannot be far away from us here. It passes through this forest. It must be nearly thirty miles to Evensham, said Cadfile. A long day's riding for a clerical party. It will be night by the time they ride past into Woodstock. If you're set on going, stay at least to get your pay, for you'll need it before the thirty miles is done. They went to their slumber in the warmth of the hall without a word more said. But he would go, Allard, whether he himself knew it yet or not. Catfile knew it. His friend was a tired horse with the scent of the stable in his nostrils. Nothing would stop him now until he reached it. It was well into the middle of the day when Roger and his escort arrived and they approached not directly as the advance party had done, but from the woods to the north, as though they had been indulging in a little hunting or a hawking by the way, except that they had neither hawk nor hound with them. A fine, clear, cool day for riding. There was no reason in the world why they should not go round about for the pure pleasure of it, and indeed they seemed to come in high content. But that Roger's mind had been so preoccupied and so anxious concerning his lawsuit that distraction seemed unlikely. Catfile was given to thinking about unlikely developments, which from old campaigns he knew to prove significant in most cases. Gosselin was apparently oblivious to the direction from which they came. That way lay Allard's highway to his rest. But what meaning ought it to have for Roger Malduit? The table was lavish that night, and Lord and Squire drank well and ate well, and gave no sign of any care, though they might, Catfile thought, watching them from his lower place, seem a little tight and knife-edged. Well, the king's court could account for that. Shrewsbury's prior was drawing steadily nearer, with whatever weapons he had for the battle. But it seemed rather an exultant tension than an anxious one. Was Roger counting his chickens already? The morning of the 22nd of November dawned, and the noon passed, and with every moment Alhard's restlessness and abstraction grew, until with evening it possessed him utterly, and he could no longer resist. He presented himself before Roger after supper, when his mood might be mellow from good food and wine. "'My lord,' 
with the morrow my service to you is completed you need me no longer and with your good will i would set forth now for where i am going i go afoot and need provision for the road if you have been content with my work pay me what is due and let me go it seemed that roger had been startled out of some equally absorbing preoccupation of his own and was in haste to return to it for he made no demur but paid at once to do him justice he had never been a grudging paymaster he drove as hard a bargain as he could at the outset but once the agreement was made he kept it go when you please he said fill your bag from the kitchen for the journey when you leave you did good work i give you that and he returned to whatever it was that so engrossed his thoughts and alhard went to collect the proffered largesse and his own meagre possessions i'm going he said meeting cadfile in the hall doorway i must go there was no more doubt in his voice or face they will take me back though in the lowest place from that there's no falling the blessed benedict wrote in the rule that even to the third time of straying a man may be received again if he promise full amendment it was a dark night without moon or stars but in fleeting moments when the wind ripped apart the cloud covering to let through a brief gleam of moonlight the weather had grown gusty and wild in the last two days the king's fleet must have had a rough crossing from bar floor you do better urge cadfile to wait for morning and go by daylight here's a safe bed and the king's peace however well enforced hardly covers every mile of the king's high roads but allard would not wait the yearning was on him too strongly and a penniless vagabond who had ventured all the roads of christendom by day or night was hardly likely to flinch from the last thirty miles of his wanderings then i'll go with you as far as the road and see you on your way said catfile there was a mile or so of track through thick forest between them and the high road that bore away west northwest on the upland journey to evensham the ribbon of open highway hemmed on both sides by trees was hardly less dark than the forest itself king henry had fenced in his private park at woodstock to house his wild beasts but maintained also his hunting chase here many miles in extent at the road they parted and cadfile stood to watch his friend march steadily away towards the west eyes fixed ahead upon his penance and his absolution a tired man with a rest assured Cadfile turned back towards the lodge as soon as the receding shadow had melted into the night. He was in no haste to go in, for the night, though blustery, was not cold, and he was in no mind to seek the company of others of the party now that the one best known to him was gone, and gone in so mysteriously rapt a fashion. He walked on among the trees, turning his back on his bed for a while. The constant thrashing of branches in the wind all but drowned the scuffling and shouting that suddenly broke out behind him at some distance among the trees until a horse's shrill whinny brought him about with a jerk and set him running through the underbrush towards the spot where confused voices yelled alarm and broken bushes thrashed the clamour seemed some little way off and he was startled as he shouldered his way headlong through a thicket to collide heavily with two entangled bodies send them spinning apart and himself fall a sprawl upon one of them in the flattened grass the man under him uttered a scared and angry cry and the voice was roger's the other man had made no sound at all but slid away very rapidly and lightly to vanish among the trees a tall shadow swallowed in shadows catfile drew off in haste reaching an arm to hoist the winded man my lord are you hurt what in god's name is to do here the sleeve he clutched slid warm and wet under his hand you're injured hold fast let's see what harm's done before you move then there was the voice of goslin for once loud and vehement in alarm shouting for his lord and crashing headlong through bush and brake to fall on his knees before roger lamenting and raging my lord my lord what happened here what rogues were those loose in the woods dared they waylay travellers so close to the king's highway you're hurt here's blood roger got his breath back and sat up feeling at his left arm below the shoulder and wincing a scratch my arm god curse him 
whoever he may be, the fellow struck from my heart. Man, if you had not come charging like a bull, I might have been dead. You hurled me off the point of his dagger. Thank God there's no great harm, but I bleed. Help me back home. That a man might not walk by night in his own woods, fumed Gosselin, hoisting his lord carefully to his feet, without being set upon by outlaws. Help here, you, Cadfile, take his other arm. Footpad so close to Woodstock. Tomorrow we must turn out the watch to comb these tracks and hunt them out of cover, before they kill. Get me within doors, snapped Roger, and have this coat and shirt off me, and let's staunch this bleeding. I'm alive, that's the main. They helped him back between them, through the more open ways, towards the lodge. It dawned on Cadfall as they went, that the clamor of furtive battle had ceased completely. Even the wind had abated, and somewhere on the road, distantly, he caught the rhythm of galloping hooves, very fast and light, as of a riderless horse in panic flight. The gash in Roger Maldit's left arm, just below the shoulder, was long but not deep, and grew shallower as it descended. The stroke that marked him thus could well have been meant for his heart. Catfile's hurtling impact at the very moment the attack was launched had been the means of averting murder. The shadow that had melted into the night had no form. Nothing about it rendered it human or recognizable. He had heard an outcry and run towards it, a projectile to strike attacked and attacker apart. Question that was all he could say, for which, said Roger, bandaged and resting and warmed with mull wine, he was heartily thankful, and indeed Roger was behaving with remarkable fortitude and calm for a man who had just escaped death. By the time he had demonstrated to his dismayed grooms and men-at-arms that he was alive and not much the worse, appointed the hour when they should set out for Woodstock in the morning, and been helped to his bed by Gosselin, there was even a suggestion of complacency about him as though a gash in the arm was a small price to pay for the successful retention of a valuable property and the defeat of his clerical opponents. In the court of the palace of Woodstock, the king's chamberlains, clerks, and judges were fluttering about in a curiously distracted manner, or so it seemed to Cadfile, standing apart among the commoners to observe their antics. They gathered in small groups, conversing in low voices and with anxious faces, broke apart to regroup with others of their kind, hurried in and out among the litigants, avoiding or brushing off all questions, exchanged documents, hurried to the door to peer out, as if looking for some late arrival. And there was indeed one litigant who had not kept to his time, for there was no sign of a Benedictine prior among those assembled, nor had any one appeared to explain or justify his absence. And Roger Mautuit, in spite of his stiff and painful arm, continued to relax with ever-increasing assurance into shining complacency. The appointed hour was already some minute past when four agitated fellows, two of them Benedictine brothers, made a hasty entrance and accosted the presiding clerk. Sir, bleated the leader, loud and nervous display. We are here come from the Abbey of Shrewsbury, escort to our prior, who is on his way to plead a case at law here. Sir, you must hold him excused, for it is not his blame nor ours that he cannot appear. In the forest some two miles north, as we rode hither last night in the dark, we were attacked by a band of lawless robbers, and they have seized our prior and dragged him away. The spokesman's voice had risen shrilly in his agitation. He had the attention of every man in the hall by this time. Certainly he had cadfiles. Masterless men some two miles out of Woodstock, plying their trade last night, could only be the same who had happened upon Roger Maudwit, and all but been the death of him. Any such gang so close to the court was astonishing enough. There could hardly be two. The clerk was outraged at the very idea. Seized and captured him? and you four were with him? Can this be true? How many were there who attacked you? We could not tell for certain, three at least, but they were lying in ambush. We had no chance to stand them off. 
They pulled him from his horse and were off into the trees with him. They knew the woods, and we did not. Sir, we did go after them, but they beat us off. It was evident they had done their best, for two of them showed bruises and scratched, and all were soiled and torn as to their clothing. We have hunted through the night, but found no trace. Only we caught his horse a mile down the highway as we came hither. So we plead here that our prior's absence be not seen as a default, for indeed he would have been here in this town last night if all had gone as it should. Hush, wait, said the clerk peremptorily. All heads had turned towards the door of the hall, where a great flurry of officials had suddenly surged into view, cleaving through the press with fixed and ominous haste to take the centre of the floor below the king's empty dais. A chamberlain, elderly and authoritative, struck the floor loudly with the staff and commanded silence. And at sight of his face, silence fell like a stone. My lords, gentlemen, all who have pleased here this day, and all others present, you are bidden to disperse, for there will be no hearings today. All suits that should be heard here must be postponed three days, and will be heard by his grace's judges. His grace the king cannot appear. This time the silence fell again like a heavy curtain, muffling even thought or conjecture. The court is in mourning from this hour. We have received news of desolating import. His grace, with the greater part of his fleet, made the crossing to England safely, as is known. But the Blanche Nef, in which his grace's son and heir, Prince William, with all his companions and many other noble souls, were embarked, put to sea late, and was caught in gales before ever clearing bar floor. The ship is lost, split upon a rock, foundered with all hands, not a soul is come safe to land. Go hence quietly, and pray for the souls of the flower of this realm. So that was the end of one man's year of triumph. An empty achievement, a ruinous victory. Normandy won, his enemies routed, and now everything swept aside, broken apart upon an obstinate rock, washed away in a malicious sea. His only lawful son, recently married in splendor, now denied even a coffin and a grave, for if they ever found those royal bodies it would be by the unrelenting grace of God, for the sea seldom put its winnings ashore by Barfleur. Even some of his unlawful sons, of whom there were many, gone down with their royal brother, no one left but the one legal daughter to inherit a barren empire. Cadfile walked alone in a corner of the king's park and considered the foolishness of mortal vainglory that was paid for with such a bitter price. But also he thought of the affairs of little men, to whom even a luckless king owed justice. For somewhere there was still to be sought the lost prior of Shrewsbury, carried off by masterless men in the forest, a litigant who might still be lost three days hence when his suit came up again for hearing, unless someone in the meantime knew where to look for him. He was in little doubt now, a lawless gang at liberty so close to a royal palace was, in any case, unlikely enough, and Cadfile was liable to brood on the unlikely. But that there should be two, no, that was impossible, and if one only, then that same one whose ambush he had overheard at some distance, yet close enough, too close for comfort, to Roger Maudit's hunting lodge. Probably the unhappy brothers from Shrewsbury were off beating the wilds of the forest afresh. Cadfile knew better where to look. No doubt Roger was biting his nails in some anxiety over the delay, but he had no reason to suppose that three days would release the captive to appear against him, nor was he paying much attention to what his Welsh man-at-arms was doing with his time. Catfile took his horse and rode back without haste towards the hunting lodge, he left in the early dusk, as soon as the evening meal was over, in Malduit's lodging. No one was paying any heed to him by that time of day. All Roger had to do was hold his tongue and keep his wits about him for three days, and the disputed manner would still be a judge to him. Everything was beautifully in hand, after all. Two of the men-at-arms and one groom had been left behind at the hunting lodge. 
cadfile doubted if the man they guard it was to be found in the house itself for unless he was blindfolded he would be able to gather far too much knowledge of his surroundings and the fable of the masterless men would be tossed into the rubbish heap no he would be held in darkness or dim light at best even during the day in straw or the rush flooring of a common hut fed adequately but plainly and roughly as wild men might keep a prisoner they were too cautious to kill or too superstitious until they turned him loose in some remote place stripped of everything he had of value on the other hand he must be somewhere securely inside the boundary fence otherwise there would be too high a risk of his being found between the gate and the house there were trees enough to obscure the large holding of a man of consequence somewhere among the stables and barns or the now empty kennels there he must be held catfile tethered his horse in cover well aside from the lodge and found himself a perch in a tall oak tree from which vantage point he could see over the fence into the courtyard he was in luck the three within fed themselves at leisure before they fed their prisoner preferring to wait for dark by the time the groom emerged from the hall with a pitcher and a bowl in his hands cadfile had his night eyes they were quite easy about their charge expecting no interference from any man the groom vanished momentarily between the trees within the enclosure but appeared again at one of the low buildings tucked under the fence set down his pitcher for a moment while he hoisted clear a heavy wooden bar that held the door fast and vanished within the door thudded too after him as though he had slammed it shut with his back braced against it taking no chances even with an elderly monastic in a few minutes he emerged again empty-handed hauled the bar into place again and returned whistling to the hall and the enjoyment of mauduit's ale not the stables nor the kennels but a small stout hay store built on short wooden piles raised from the ground at least the prior would have fairly snug lying cadfile let the last of the light fade before he made a move the wooden wall was stout and high but more than one of the old trees outside leaned the branch over it and it was no great labor to climb without and drop into the deep grass within he made first for the gate and quietly unbarred the narrow wicket set into it faint threads of torchlight filtered through the chinks in the hall shutters but nothing else stirred cadfile laid hold of the heavy bar of the storehouse door and eased it silently out of its socket opening the door by cautious inches and whispering through the chink father there was a sharp rustling of hay within but no immediate reply father prior is it you softly are you bound a hesitant and slightly timorous voice said no and in a moment with better assurance my son you are not one of these sinful men sinful man i am but not of their company hush quietly now i have a horse close by i came from woodstock to find you reach me your hand father and come forth a hand came wavering out of the hay-scented darkness to clutch convulsively at cadfile's hand the pale patch of a tonsured crown gleamed faintly and a small rounded figure crept forth and stepped into the thick grass he had the wit to waste no breath then on questions but stood docile and silent while catfile rebarred the door on emptiness and taking him by the hand led him softly along the fence to the unfastened wicket in the great gate only when the door was closed as softly behind them did he heave a great thankful sigh they were out it was done and no one would be likely to learn of the escape until morning cadfile led the way to where he had left his horse tethered the forest lay serene and quiet about them you ride father and i'll walk with you it's no more than two miles into woodstock we're safe enough now bewildered and confused by so sudden a reversal the prior confided and obeyed like a child not until they were out on the silent high road did he say sadly i have failed on my mission son may god bless you for this kindness which is beyond my understanding for how did you know of me and how could you divine where to find me i understand nothing of what has been happening to me 
and i am not a very brave man but my failure is no fault of yours and my blessing i owe you without stint you have not failed father said cadfa simply the suit is still unheard and will be for three days more all your companions are safe in woodstock except that they fret and search for you and if you know where they will be lodging i would recommend that you join them now by night and stay well out of sight until the day the case is heard for if this trap was designed to keep you from appearing in the king's court, some further attempt might yet be made. Have you your evidences safe? They did not take them? Brother Orderic, my clerk, was carrying the documents, but he could not conduct the case in court. I only am accredited to represent my abbot. But my son, how is it that the case still goes unheard? The king keeps strict day and time. It's well known. How comes it that God and you have saved me from disgrace and loss? Father, for all too bitter reason, the king could not be present. Cadfile told him the whole of it, how half the young chivalry of England had been wiped out in one blow, and the king left without an heir. Prior Heribert, shocked and dismayed, fell to praying in a grieving whisper for both dead and living, and Cadfile walked beside the horse in silence, for what more was there to be said? Except that King Henry, even in the shattering hour, willed that his justice should still prevail, and that was virtue in any monarch. Only when they came into the sleeping town did Cadfile again interrupt the prior's fervent prayers with a strange question. Father, was any man of your escort carrying steel, a dagger, or any such weapon? No, no, God forbid, said the prior, shocked. We have no use for arms. We trust in God's peace, and after it in the king's. So I thought, said Cadfile, nodding. It is another discipline for another venture. By the change in Mauduit's countenance, Cadfile knew the hour of the following day when the news reached him that his prisoner was flown. All the rest of that day he went about with nerves at stretch and ears pricked for any sensational rumors being bandied around the town, and eyes roving anxiously in dread of the sight of Prior Heribert in court or street, braced to pour out his complaint to the king's officers. But as the hours passed and still there was no sign, he began to be a little eased in his mind, and to hope still for a miraculous deliverance. The Benedictine brothers were seen here and there, mute and somber-faced, surely they could have had no word of their superior there was nothing to be done but set his teeth keep his countenance wait and hope the second day passed and the third day came and maudit's hopes had soared again for still there was no word he made his appearance before the king's judge confidently his charters in hand the abbey was the suitor if all went well roger would not even have to state his case for the plea would fail of itself when the pleader failed to appear. It came as a shattering shock when a sudden stir at the door, prompt to the hour appointed, blew into the hall a small, round, unimpressive person in the Benedictine habit, hugging to him an armful of vellum rolls, and followed by his black-gowned brothers in close attendance. Cadfile, too, was observing him with interest, for it was the first time he had seen him clearly. A modest man of comfortable figure and amiable countenance, rosy and mild, not so old as that night journey had suggested, perhaps forty-five, with a shining innocence about him, but to Roger Maudit it might have been a fire-breathing dragon entering the hall. And who would have expected from that gentle, even deprecating presence, the clarity and expertise with which the small man deployed his original charter? punctiliously identical to Rogers, according to the account Allard had given, and omitting any specific mention of what should follow Arnulf Maudit's death. How scrupulously he pointed out the omission and the arguments to which it might give rise, and followed it up with two letters written by the same Arnulf Maudit to Abbot Fulcherin, referring in plain terms to the obligatory return of the manor and village after his death and pledging his son's loyal observance of the obligation. 
it might have been want of proofs that caused roger to make so poor a job of refuting the evidence or it might have been craven conscience whatever the cause judgment was given for the abbey catfile presented himself before the lord he was leaving barely an hour after the verdict was given my lord your suit is concluded and my service with it i've done what i pledged here i part from you roger sat sunk in gloom and rage and lifted upon him a glare that should have felled him but failed of its impact i misdoubt me said roger smouldering how you have observed your loyalty to me who else could know he bit his tongue in time for as long as it remained unsaid no accusation had been made and no rebuttal was needed he would have liked to ask how did you know but he thought better of it go then if you have nothing more to say as to that said cadfile meaningly nothing more need be said it's over and that was recognizable as a promise but with uneasy implications for plainly on some other matter he still had a thing to say my lord give some thought to this for i was until now in your service and wish you no harm of those four who attended prior heribert on his way here not one carried arms there was neither sword nor dagger nor knife of any kind among the five of them he saw the significance of that go home slowly but with bitter force the masterless men had been nothing but a children's tale but until now roger had thought as he had been meant to think that the dagger stroke in the forest had been a bold attempt by an abbey servant to defend his prior he blinked and swallowed and stared and began to sweat beholding a perilous gulf into which he had all but stumbled there were none there who bore arms said cadfile but your own a double-edged ambush that had been to have him out in the forest by night all unsuspecting and there were as many miles between woodstock and sutton maldite returning as coming and there would be other nights as dark on the way who asked roger in a grating whisper which of them give me a name no said cadfile simply do your own divining i am no longer in your service i have said all i mean to say roger's face had turned gray he was hearing again the plan unfolded so seductively in his ear you cannot leave me so if you know so much for god's sake return with me see me safely home at least you i could trust no said cadfile again you were warned now guard yourself it was fair he considered it was enough he turned and went away without another word he went just as he was to vespers in the parish church for no better reason or so he thought then that the dimness within the open doorway beckoned him as he turned his back on a duty completed inviting him to quietness and thought and the bell was just sounding the little prior was there ardent in thanksgiving one more creature who had fumbled his way to the completion of a task and the turning of a leaf in the book of his life catfire watched out the office and stood mute and still for some time after priest and worshippers had departed the silence after their going was deeper than the ocean and more secure than the earth cadfile breathed and consumed it like new bread it was the light touch of a small hand on the hilt of his sword that startled him out of that profound isolation he looked down to see a little acolyte no higher than his elbow regarding him gravely from great round eyes of blinding blue intent and challenging as solemn as ever was angelic messenger sir said the child in stern treble reproof tapping the hilt with his infant finger should not all weapons of war be laid aside here sir said cadfile hardly less gravely though he was smiling you may very well be right and slowly he unbuckled the sword from his belt and went and laid it down flatlings on a low step under the altar it looked strangely appropriate and at peace there the hilt after all was a cross prior heribert was at a frugal supper with his happy brothers in the parish priest's house when cadfile asked audience with him the little man came out graciously to welcome a stranger and knew him for an acquaintance at least and 
now at a breath certainly a friend you my son and surely it was you at vespers i felt that i should know the shape of you you are the most welcome of guests here and if there is anything i and mine could do to repay you for what you did for us you need but name it father said catfile briskly welsh and is asking do you ride for home to-morrow surely my son we leave after prime abbot godifred will be waiting to hear how we have fared then father here i am at the turning of my life free of one master's service and finished with arms take me with you the end of a light on the road to woodstock by ellis peters <laughs>